place we're going to create your own 3D model starting from the start of yesterday. All of you are receiving this folder, this lens like UK, where there are all the photos collected with the hydro. In particular, there are 194 photos. So the first step is to go through the software to align the photos. Okay? When all of you has this set of photos, we can start. I hope in five minutes. Set of photos for each table. Now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So the first step is to upload the, all, all the photos that are in the folder. So it's the step zero of the workflow. So you have to click on workflow and add photos. Go in the folder. This lens now. Lens like UK. Then, then select the entire set of photos. Wait for the upload. And then since uh, we have not a lot of time today, we will run the process in low resolution. Yeah. Okay. So click on align photos to start the align processing. Select low and pay attention to these things. Since we have the reference attached to the photo, so the location by GPS, we have just to use reference resolution. Sorry, align photos. Align photos. Workflow. Workflow. Align photos. Firstly, you have to upload the photos. Okay. And then select accuracy low. So at the first round, probably you will find the less number of common points on the photo. And then reference resolution. And then push OK. And it's start select detecting common points and try to align the photos. If we collected the photos correctly, we will have a first version of the points. On the contrary, is that we have some problem with the photos, we will have problem. Now we are going to discover this. I already know the answer. <laughs> For example, approximately <laughs> uh, two, uh, two seconds for each photo, and then I go back. Uh, back. Ah, back. No, it's okay. You can yeah. Again, two. <laughs> for the best. I'm taking the photo. For example, at two seconds. Again, back. Again, a bird. <laughs> Dancing bird, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and when we are finished, we need to pull down the drone. And to, uh, uh, we need to be careful about the shadows because yes. the shadows uh, will be a problem in the processing of an image. And uh, we should uh, we should not include the sea. I cannot remember the exact thing. Yes, good point. Why? Uh, because it will be a problem too much in pixels when we have to process the image in the Okay, it's also because the sea is moving. Okay, that's correct. Ah, and, <laughs> and also the, the water is a bit transparent, so in reality, when you take the picture with the water, you see it below, below oh, the water, okay. sorry, below. Okay. So you are forgetting fish. <laughs> no, fish without chips. <laughs> and then what we have done, a mark of the flying above the land. So 
we take photo from the top from the cliff of the red line you know we took issue to cover for the area because if I take a photo from the bow under something I don't see anything so I have a problem I am missing information but if you remember at the very beginning when I started with the flight I have done a very very big mistake they said oh no I did a mistake I have to restart again what was this mistake Specify the path of the no, another one. Also, the audience can follow. Ah, yeah, the orientation of the camera. Exactly, yeah. the orientation of the camera. I started collecting photos that mm -hmm. faces the sea <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of the terrain. Okay, I think that. Uh, and we need to specify for the camera is that the same rotation in every photo. For this photo shoot. Yeah. Each leg of the step. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, when we fly above the terrain, the camera was. <laughs> yes, uh, when we twist the scarf, the scarf and the lens light, to replicate, yes, but I did something different because I would have to exclude also the sky from the photos and also the lens light are not very vertical, they have an inclination of about 360, so I oriented the camera to be perpendicular to the lens light, around the 60, excluding so now when we process these pictures remember what exactly what we have done what we have done, what we have done. Uh, come on <laughs> can you cut from the, the, <laughs> the okay so now when you finish the project the process look at the result and let me know if you like the result or not and then we discuss why thank you solve this problem in reality just it just done a check so please describe the check uh, so we have to focus the area that uh, Fabio yesterday uh, passed with the drone and to do this I simply uh, double click in the such a random area when you double click uh, in a rotate uh, the, the double click permit and allows you to define a new pivot for uh, the new rotation so you can see this I, uh, I I miss some rotation in this pivot and then if I double click in this uh, one the pivot will change then uh, I'll try to focus <coughs> we are in your end Do you have any, can you zoom out now? Yeah. Zoom out again, zoom out again, zoom out again. Do you have any idea why we have two different sets of photos and two different sets of points in the space? The one in the top, the one in the face. No. Zoom in again, because we have, in this case, we have a set of photos from above and one from the front. So mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly what you say. It's more easier than what you think. For a different uh, orientation of the work, uh, so. Look, think about what we have done. We have used the reference selection from the cameras. Yeah. 
to align the photos. So some wrong. Probably, no, probably we have some in some errors mm -hmm. in the reference. Mm -hmm. Some should even work as a while. Only some is going to work. Now, what you do get to do is to select a set of photos only from the book, and then the photos can be from the text. So you can separate them very easily. Yes, create a new folder with the, only the photos that from your files are taken from the book. And then we process again the So in the meantime, the same process as in the model, only the photo taken from the book, we got to see what kind of information are included. I have to close the program. The book, the are less number. Please consider that the photos, you have a small number of photos, but also include the C and the C. That photos are taken with the eagle at 45 degrees, not from the book. They must be in another folder. Okay. Okay. Part of the number of pixels, pixels, the resolution, etc. You have information about the camera, like from the depth, kind of exterior, what, the focal distance, and the software always consider this information. But much more important, you have information about latitude, longitude, and altitude. In this case, this drone works in this manner when we start off the point is the zero level which then gives you the information of how much it is above the starting point. Okay. Other drones 
Fabio, can you enter an aperture between those? Yes. yes. Like if you fly from a benchmark. Yes. Sure. In fact, at the end of the day, we took the altitude from a benchmark, the high, more or less high resolution GPS with an accuracy of around 5 meters, maybe. And so we can correct the entire resulting model. Or you can locate on the terrain more than one target using a very high resolution GPS and then include this information in the model in the model itself. And the result is the GPS elevation model will be related to the real world. So guys, we need other volunteers to discuss what we are going on the screen. Another couple of people, come on. Another couple of people, come on. One, one should be a professor. Not me, a wife. One from this table. Ah. Okay, let me to choose someone. <laughs> <laughs> from France, one from France. Okay, one person for table, come on. One is already there, so one from here and one from the other table. Come on, we will see. <laughs> One from this table. Discuss what we are looking on the screen. What is the problem? <laughs> yes, yeah, there, there is a disability to recognize. Tell them what the problem is. <laughs> One from this table, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. come on. Yes, one for also one of you. <laughs> come on. Yeah. Okay. I give you a little suggestion. This is the vertical axis. Look at the photos. 
maybe they are good or not. Not good at all. Not good at all. Why? It's the Dutch currency, of course. Yes. Uh, it runs execution on this. Mm -hmm. So you should have some features that run on this. I do not use Word, try to use the rule. Mm -hmm. It's some problem. Wow. I want the taxes. Do you think that is okay? What are you doing? Try again. Measure the distance between the two sets of photos. They are as far as six kilometers. Do you think that is correct? So? Yes, GPS reference. There is some mistake using the GPS reference in one set of photos. So, now, Looking through the set of photos that face vertical the scar, please create another folder with the photos that are bad, that we are not going to use it at all. Checking the information about GPS. Photos by photos. I, I did it tonight for you. Yesterday night, sorry. It's the problem. Now I'm going to explain to all of us this theory. This theory. happen because uh, it depends on what type of drone you use. My small one gets up by pressure. So when I force him to go below zero, he goes crazy. There are other drones that use the other from GPS and probably we have new drones that use an RTK GPS for the other. In that case, adding from GPS will be very, very reliable, okay? What can I do in this case is to correct manually the altitude or trying to process in another way the, the photos, avoiding the reference information, but what I need, I need the control points and I need the scale, we don't have this case. So what we can do is to just exclude, remove the set of photos and try to run the model again. Taking into account that sometimes when you are forcing me to kill taking the camera with your cameras, the GPS included like my one, mm -hmm. sometimes the GPS uh, wrong the altitude also often around 10 kilometers. You have to remove this. Mm -hmm. And this is the spark cloud. So the first set of points that the software found may be the alignment of the photos. Now the next step is to create the dense cloud, so to increase the number of common points. So workflow, dense cloud, low quality, please. And then, uh, regarding the depth filtering, choose my safe time. And then, start the calculation. Probably can take 20 minutes. I don't know. Work, work, work. <laughs> I show you what I processed yesterday night and what we are targeting. Okay. This is the dense cloud. 
where I use just a photo from the book. All of them are common points and there are around more than 5 million of points. Over 133 calories. Very, very big number. This is the result in digital elevation model that has a resolution around 5 centimeters. It is very high resolution. In fact, in fact you can see these blocks that are on the screen. Okay, what was the altitude? Yes. The digital elevation model. No, no. Each point has the surface classified by point. It is it's the equivalent of the digital elevation model. I have to export it in a format like GP or ASCII. So this uh, was uh, the drone survey survey from your drone, the mini. Yes, from the mini drone. Ah, uh, Malcolm. Do we have data, Malcolm? Do we have data from from the big one? Well, yeah. No, we sent a uh, load here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's only for the Yeah, it's yeah. not that, it's not that. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But, uh, it's not the, the full point the, the format. Ah, so we don't have the, uh, yeah. the whole... Uh, slope. Great, great. After, after this, perfect. And not to compare also, that will be great also for the students to see the different drones, yeah. the survey and yeah. the results. That will be great. Excellent. Please notice, guys, that this kind of model, you see there is a negative altitude. Why? Because it's going up. Because it's up. Exactly. So, uh, in the field, we target one point, so we are just to move up our model to the real goal. Okay? Then, this is the ortho mosaic. The ortho mosaic has a resolution of one centimeter. Just with a selfie drone, guys, with a selfie drone. And this is the target. Okay, you can see. Do you remember the target? Okay. This is the target with an altitude of 71 meters above the sea level. the vertical cliff, then the landslide deposits, then here there is the beach, and we work just here. Oh, we are just here. We are just here. We are just here. with an area of 100 to 70 hundred meters. It's not very small area. Consider that we use a safety drone and we fly just uh, 9 minutes. It's a large area. Can you imagine to go down for the roof, facing the vertical speed, taking the height of the deposit, <laughs> measuring how large the landslide deposit puts the entire day probably. Yeah. Here in eight minutes we collected the uh, information necessary to generate a 3D model. <coughs> the next step, or anyway, probably for 
not just sociological pathways regarding the analysis of the pathology should be enough. But to create a, a real treatment model that can be navigated by virtual reality, we need to ask the computer people what they need. So, yes, please ask. And so now we can start the discussion with them, in the meantime that you read this process, to understand what they need, how they work, in order to create an interaction uh, to freeze the 3D model forever to be navigated in the lab. Okay, thank you. Also your colleagues, please. Question. Yes. Uh, how do we calibrate the cervical tissue there? I mean, you, you measure the 71 uh, meters above sea level uh, yeah. on the point, and the in photo scan, what do you do to calibrate to calibrate correctly the attitude of the tent? In photo scan, you can add targets. For example, this photo. Okay. If I know correct location in the real world of all these targets, I can add points in all the photos, the software automatically recognizes this point. And so, during the process, it considers your point as a real point in the world, and then calculate the real attitude and the real spacing. Because here we don't have the... the we don't have, we have just one because we were in a rush. Yes, but we, so we can calibrate the attitude with with photos? The recent most version of the software suggest, suggested that Ten. by best practice, five are enough. Yeah. Four around the corner, uh, and one more or less in the uh, center of the corner. Or anyway, in the center of the area that you and study. So um, <coughs> this, you can do it after the dense cloud uh, calculation? You, you can, uh, put, uh, you can have this information for what they know at any stage. What I do is to add this information at the very beginning, okay. after the first round of alignment. Yeah, after the first round. <coughs> yeah, 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 to save time, just to save time. Right. And so you, there is a, it's in, on the workflow to see so where is the, in the options. If, let, let's pretend you, you know one Just place. right button and create one. Okay, and that's enough. That's enough. Then you go to the, ta the related table, add the coordinates and the altitude. And this can be done also in lab, in the analog experiment. If you create your phone wall, yeah. with the precision of one millimeter or below the millimeter, and then you can add that. It's the same approach. No, 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 no. Okay. But you've been using art, what do you say, art? So from a series of images, right, you've been creating these point clouds, which are a bunch of dots that represent some sort of mental plane. And those points are x, y, z coordinates, right? The three axes in three D space. We use points like this as well to create the three D models, right? They're just a collection of points that are connected together. In our case, we call the points vertices or singular vertex and they're used to describe the 3D model which you, you might recognize some of this stuff from Mel's talk yesterday, I don't know if you went over that. But the, the, ver the vertices mean some connection, right? So this edge of this point, this point cloud, you don't have a surface. You probably noticed that in the software zoomed in, you ended up with just dots with no actual surface. So by creating the connection, that's how you create an actual 3D model. And to do this in 3D, what we would do is have three points, we connect them to a triangle, and then those and all those triangles describe the surface of the 3D model. And I can show you an example. This is the cliff we were at the top of yesterday in the Peter's 
stuff like this to anyway. And if we zoom in, we can see how the surface is just made up of these loads and loads of flat surfaces, right? Each each one of these is a triangle. Yeah, the reason yeah. Well, you can approximate any model using using triangles, and it's the the format that game engines use, and it's the format that offline three D software uses. So it's a learning experience. Is it okay to say, for example, for for the two, when you are on three, you say more than it's very thin, right? And then for this triangle, the way that I see it at the moment, I remember to give it a question the other day, it's it's flat, right? So the triangle has a fixed value across the triangle. In between the vertices, right? That's why you see the edges between the triangles. And the yeah. question is how to prove the way to become more smooth, and finally it becomes shape shape, so it looks real. Yeah, so you can. I want to make a demonstration on that. So, how we're using Reeves and how Newton provides with the information you need, there's kind of two ways that that works. One is to create models like this which is a distinct area, right? This is where you have it, where you, it's one specific area, but it's not too large. So we can represent it in this way with loads of little triangles. The problem is something even this large can get into the millions. This is a quite low resolution version. So this could be 1.1 million, I think they could be generated at the time for this small area. If you've got London, a much larger area, you're getting into the tens of millions of triangles, and computers just aren't quick enough to do that, especially not in VR. So this method of representing surfaces can get you the most detail, but it's not necessarily what you want for real time. And it's technically important, but it's not what you want for VR because you just can't get the speed, at least not yet. Which so how we are currently we get calculation about the chance of for example if I tell you you're how yes. much, how big it would be oh. in terms of handling? Because mm -hmm. you need for every vertex, you need an X and a Y and a Z, right? And then for each one of those numbers, you need like a float number. Yeah. That's what you get one point. The float, the float number will be like four bytes. So you need four times three, 12 bytes per vertex, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to calculate the number of triangles you have, the number of vertices, multiply, and then start on 24 bytes, kilobytes. Start on 24 kilobytes, megabytes. Start on 24 megabytes, bytes or gigabytes, yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So you can do a calculation and actually see how much space this thing would need to be stored in memory to be manipulated. Okay. Yeah. It's about two days to load. Right. Oh, that's good. Okay. Can you do three things? Okay. Yeah. So what do um, That's bits, which is just two vertices. Mm -hmm. Byte is eight bits, right? Mm -hmm. It's four bytes, right? So we only divide well, over four bytes per float. Right. We have three of those three floats, which yeah. is point. So that's times three. And then how about if you have like some color information as well? You might have like color for every vertex, then you have an RGB value as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's another three floats. So give them some texture that's slightly more useful. So let's just do the, the position. Yeah, just the the position. Gigabytes. If you get into millions of vertices, you end up with gigabytes of data, and it's, you just can't fit that onto the memory on a graphics card. It just it, it won't even fit, let alone run a decent decent frame. So what we can do to alleviate that is, rather than storing each individual point, we have height maps. Right. This is the elevation table. Completely comes off. You don't store. Maps. 
necessarily the individual points. You have a set of vertices that are all connected that are coarser than the height of the table. So you might have text projected from above. In this case, you're highlighting. Presumably in VR, half of the model works, but some of those things that Mel talked about, not using data, they only mm -hmm. have to, yeah. and things in the distance would be really rather than the yeah. anyway. Yeah. Problem solving, yeah. implementing that in some way. Does that still have to be created? Yeah. yeah. Things like, um, so this is a level of the detail that we talk about, right? And normally you look view dependent, depending upon where you look at it and how far you are. And it does have a number of criteria, and based on this, we display the appropriate resolution for the time so that it yeah. looks good from the point of view where you are. Mm -hmm. Problem with doing that necessarily is it doesn't always reduce frames. Sometimes it just reduces frames. So if I'm looking mm -hmm. this way, I don't need to draw behind mm -hmm. or some levels behind. So if I'm walking back, I don't need to see it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the memory still is yeah. still a problem. Yeah. And this way of just playing on. What we've, we have actually got this loaded into into Usable. So we don't have the walking around or anything yet, but this was the clicks we were at yesterday. And if any of you gave me the need to zoom right in, you could have a look at all the detail. And if this was set up, you'd be able to walk along each of this, although it's accessible from where we were. Is that still with the course triangles? This is yeah. This is triangles, but this is a pixel. Okay. But, uh, so what we tend to do is the point from here, like all of the detail, is not necessarily uh, one of these points. We have we build a circle and triangles. So we've been trying to get it working where you can have your phone and just look at an object in three D space and look around it. I don't know if that's something people would even find useful. The benefit of VR is you see what you're there. Mm -hmm. Whereas AR, you can kind of go in and look at an actual three D application and you can see what the model view the model. If we wanted to measure a point, because um, that's something we want to be able to do that, um, you you have a triangulation or triangle method or whatever. But if we clicked on the point of texture, yeah. we then go back to the the more the finer data to have a a better point. It would be in theory. In so theory. Depends. The height map that you get can only give you measurements. Because yes. you can just, if this has um, less precision than the one set of X plus one, yeah. you can find out that from this and find out that from this point. And then you need that as your sample. 
What one of the ideas that we've got here is that we've got a huge chunk of room underneath this mass. Yeah. Um, so we've already, if we look at this as a model, right? If we look at the points here, yeah. Z and this, this height, yeah. so we, we stretch it out until the distance click towards. And so we do math. We might want to be able to have the coordinates on the ball curve and the mesh. Yeah. And then the final model would be to import those coordinates and then find out the final yeah. coordinates are. So rather than asking you to do the complete the precision in the R, if the sub will locate the coordinates, then find it. Yeah, that would work. Yes. The, the orthographic geometry that has the detail height of it, it can obviously have comparison between the x and y coordinates. Yeah. And you can now put into the, the image. Yeah. And you can get a sample of those points. I can find the image and then we'll see how we are. Down to low, low uh, resolution, low level of detail. Yeah. So, what, what techniques are there to simplify, and, and how much we can simplify, so we can still recognize the basic features that are geologically important? Well, it depends on what you're using the data for. If it's just mm -hmm. a kind of, you want to understand the very broad features, we can bring it down. Sort of features, especially if you do if you're suggesting where you use samples from the high resolution, like you're finding a, a kind of basic idea in VR, but it really depends on what the technique case is. Because if you need that super high resolution, just losing it for the sake of speed to the application is not. So, for example, meaningful VR applications for the roof structure, for example, what would be a kind of low resolution because there is more than then apply a high resolution texture on top of it. That's one way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. So what how low yeah. the resolution can go? Depends on the VR model. On a phone it might be a lot lower. On a high desktop you can put it in and say the question. Do you think that it's possible to reach the same quality that we experienced with the, the other software of the R? Or a better quality? I think it depends on the data and how well we can constrain it. You know, because memory is the thing is, um, we have to be, we have some model 
with a pixel size resolution that is lower than one centimeter. Yeah. So there's no lower limit at all. Yeah. Okay. You can keep going down and down and down. The problem is the smaller you go, the, the larger your memory requirement. Yes. And you would have what like sixteen gigabytes on each bit, which is a like really nice graphics card and even better eight gigabytes of RAM. So if you get down to centimeters and then you want a kilometer of that resolution. Probably not. Probably not. It's, it's, it's just too large. So then you could make a clever memory management scheme, right? To be able to load and unload in an ordered way, right? So yeah. It's, it's and that's, I think, one of the areas we identified as something we want to work on for a couple of hours in terms of getting the data in and unloading and sending it. Because we know it's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. What would be preferable is if you come in really close to this and then you load them all directly in yeah. and then once you can move on. Probably this is yeah. what the other app is. Which one? The other app. The free to be really good app. Mm -hmm. I cannot see the name, sorry. Yeah. It's probably you, you came across the time that we recorded it. Yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't have known the way to sort of predict right, uh, where we would be next, right? So you load onto the daily or the daily in the, your neighborhood. Yeah. So then uh, once you load already, it's what it's about for you to go to, to clear already so you can accelerate. Yeah. The problem with that kind of prediction is that you want to be able to experience your drone on the ground first. Yeah. 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 Prediction yeah. management yeah. is really yeah. tricky. Yeah. Uh, another question, do you think that it's possible to, in the future, um, to, to change in real time the texture and the resolution of model? Because, for example, uh, the new layer may be detected or related to reality, but for research purposes, and also for fishing purposes, mm -hmm. it should be nice for also to see why not the slope. So changing in real time or focusing in some places, changing the texture, changing the information that you can actually get. You can keep it on the surface there, but changing the, the color. The color, yes. Yeah, there's no reason why you, you couldn't do that because all we're doing with the, the, the color is just this texture has some information, put that color. Colors, yeah, you can apply that to the surface. The problem is, you don't know anyway. Yeah. If we have loads and loads of textures, we have to keep it. And it's a lot of memory. And then there's also the problem of if you're constantly switching textures a lot and you need to bring that in, what you don't want is a click a button to change the, the information and then the report. Geologies. Any question, please? Any curiosity? So the texture is, is just a it's a picture, right? Okay. You can't you can't what will happen is each of these triangles, mm -hmm. the three points will be matched to somewhere in between. And then the computer will work out at each pixel where it needs to find the color from. Okay. So it's transformation, right? From like a thin grid, right? Into a straight line. Right? Guys, students, have you not been wondering how to do that? So we have like a 2D picture there with a texture. And there the model is a 3D made up of small flat elements, small triangles, right? That are connected along the edges, right, with lines and vertices. So how do we actually wrap around that image onto that non-2D thing? Have you wondered about that? It's, it's like having like an irregular shape, then you have a 2D image, and then you try to wrap it around to make it fit nicely, right? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think the students need a break. Yeah. Well, we are very well, we are very close to the to the end. To the yes. end. Yeah. 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 Anyway, a coffee break is, is always my, uh, welcome. So. Is there another session after this? No. Is this finished for that? We are finished at 5 p.m. Then discussion between students. So we will finish this and then coffee break. Yes. Yeah. Right. So maybe a few words in five minutes or so about urine mapping. Okay. So the surface here that is represented by triangles, each of those triangles has what's called a UV mapping, which is it's a 2D coordinate which describes where to look on this texture. So this here is the kind of grid. It's, it's noisy. These are all the points, and they describe, the, or they relate to a 3D point. So this is this surface, this 3D one, is flattened out into a 2D space. So I don't know whether you kids, like way back in primary school, you got like a, a bunch of squares in a pattern, and you fold them up into a cube. That's what this is. So it's this 3D surface cut up and laid flat. And then by doing that, bringing it in this this grid, we can map north to one and north to one as two D coordinates of three D points. And by doing that you can look at the points in the three D and say at this three D point it's got a map into a two D point, which I can take that two D point, find it in texture, and then apply. There's a little bit to do. Sometimes an artist can go in and manually and that's it. And then there's a few hours. Better 
about the topographic data that we will process and you can create a very nice large scale. If something is wrong, okay, do you need data, do you need uh, knowledge from the geologists or is that okay for the, for, for, from the computer science? From, from just a straight data, if you didn't have a geologist, let's say, and that, that yeah. would be the sense that you okay. probably not come from the know. Unless it was specifically or obviously not from a certain point. So maybe ideal would have somebody with the experience. Okay, guys, did you, did you hear this? Look, look. I repeat that, but very loudly. Please. Repeat. I mean, ideally, it would be good to have somebody with the knowledge to look at the data and make sure it's correct. Even though, even if we know about it, we might not be able to find out the more details. Okay. So th this is the purpose of this Erasmus course, okay? Mm -hmm. Not not to not to work together and not to be only the geologists on the field, but also to help the people that they are occupied with the computer science and can create these beautiful images uh, that can understand that okay, this is correct or not, this is not correct, and we have geologists and uh, computer science together. Okay, that, that's this is the point of this, and we we have been funded. This Erasmus program has been funded because of this reason. Because we say that we will be on the field, but we will create or we will have some summer schools uh, bring together all the kind of the different disciplines of the students, not only geologists, or not only uh, creative technology or computer science. Okay, that's the point, thanks. This is the point. And uh, how do you make the knowledge? I mean, you take the picture, you have to yeah. take the picture as well, exactly. so you work with the software for each you know, picture being a bit wrong. Yeah. Incorrectly, which then will create more problems with actually creating the models of this. Also for us, when, when we are have the acquisition, I will show you, I will try to show you acquisition of the uh, Nutrien data, okay, we need to have a technician close to us. If the technician made a mistake and the acquisition is wrong, we are going to collect the wrong data. So we cannot process the data. To tell you an example, I was in the Atlantic Ocean and we spent more than three days to do ROV mapping and the data that they have been collected, they have wrong being, uh, rolling beams, so something uh, very completely wrong. So we collected the data and we see that we cannot do anything, anything at all. So we cannot process the data because the technician that was on board, they didn't look very carefully on the data, so we collected the wrong ones. So three days for nothing. Okay, so that's, that's similar to have someone not technical, but someone from the computer science to tell you that this is correctly or not. Okay, that's good. Good. That, that will be, that was very good. Uh, with your contribution. Thanks. Thank so, so, suppose something very specific in that you be mapping, for example, if something is wrong and you want to fix it, right? Can you go and fix it there without having a geologist, geologist with you to give you an idea as to what is geologically speaking wrong with it? How easy is it to adapt to the system if the map is wrong? And the, the, the result is not correct. So then you do the mapping, and then the result says that's not correct. So how do you fix that? No, they the can, the geologists can go back to the field and they can collect data. They cannot collect data by themselves. What are the way of that to the mapping in a way to make it more geologically correct, no? Yeah, that's right. Part of the 
I've not seen, it's not the same thing when we know we have emotions. Someone yeah. can go and say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. then the one way they will be real, so what they want to do with the world, they will change the emotions. Okay, good point. Yeah. Perfect. So, coffee break. Coffee break. Coffee break. And then, guys, after coffee break, I will give you the final Orco Mosaic from your world. Because if you are using a demo version, so you cannot export the Orco Mosaic, but I did. Also, the final digital regression model and a 3D model that you can over with Paint 3D on your home computer. Okay? And then, interview. we want is a discussion between the different groups of students. We've got geologists, geographers, we've got oceanographers, we've even got an atmospheric scientist we're going to talk about, and we have the creative scientists. So five groups, we want them to discuss what they would like out of this project. So what each group is looking for and to find the points in common between them. Good points, bad points, and what are their best dreams for what possibly can be a reality. What do you think of them? Has it been of any use, you learning more about this? Does it help you understand what, what these people need? They might not know what they need, but maybe you do. So, over to you. So, so some of the, uh, what has been useful is kind of knowing exactly what it is your processes output because we know that you want to visualize this data so that you can see its usefulness and you can see know what you're looking at just by, by kind of a, by having that, that that 3d model there and being able to not necessarily need to go out to the fields every single time and being able to see the same the same kind of experiences you get in the field so you can actually look at those bits and see how it all goes together but not in just numbers on, on a page it's that kind of usefulness of visualization but one of the main reasons i wanted to do this is to know exactly what it is that you or what data you create and how that the workflow to get it into into uh, game engines because before this it was we know Okay, you want to visualize geo geographic data. What, what is what is that? Are we talking about small scales? Is it like a rock? Or is it a cliff? Or is it massive, massive areas? Specifically, do we need to do things like one of the um, 
concerns I was having was when you have it from above, which we were doing before with the terrain, you can't have flips because you just lose the information. So is that something we need do we need to we need to develop workflows that work with <coughs> vertical surfaces as well as flat surfaces? So that's one of the main benefits of me is it's given me a better understanding of what your the output of your work your output is the input into what we do, which is the, the, the visualization. Okay. Yeah. Let's group next year. That's a bunch of geologists, geographers, <laughs> and whatever. But speak up if you want to ask a question. Right. So to ask a question here at this point to say something like, did you see, for example, in the technology that you're familiar with, right? Like games and visualization and all that stuff, right? Did you see any limitations in this technology after interacting with these guys? Did you see some that was there which you did not know how to use and now you realize, oh, there's a use for this? And actually, I can do something extraordinary which I didn't think of before? In terms of limitations, like I was saying about the, the cliff rendering, right? The terrain that we're used to using in, in, in game engines doesn't apply to real world terrain. Because the tools that we use can't adequately represent what your data looks. So that's, that's definitely one of the use. There's room to improve the tools that we in games and well, the game specifically, what we use to represent terrain. It's just, it's not good enough to actually do what you need as geologists who are trying to create terrain. That's, that's one area. There you go. Uh, fine. Just one suggestion. Maybe uh, we didn't talk about this yet. Maybe geology for you is, I don't know, we can, it's been static, but maybe we can integrate the like movement, like create different products in the same object in different time. And to integrate the movement, I don't know, and then the authority to, to see, to visualize the movement, I don't know. Landslide, I don't know, or something. So to integrate the movements in yeah. this, I don't. It can be very complicated, I, for sure. But uh, it can be uh, something interesting to do. I don't know. We didn't think about this. So. Yeah, we are a step in front. Yes. Or yeah, for yeah. Sure. Asking, yeah, asking. That's a very good question, because uh, we are starting a project. The, the department, no, the, the students from the University of Athens and the students from the University of Portsmouth, they will create in 3D animation the volcanic history of Nea and Palea Kameni in order to be presented on Sadorini Summer School. Okay, so this is completely a, a, a movement. Okay, so you will have different volcanic eruptions inside Sadorini Caldera and it will be shown to the students in 3D reality. So that is also a result of, uh, of Erasmus project. And to tell you the truth, we cannot do it that for only by, by ourselves, okay, having only the geological background, but we need definitely the support of the students of computer science. Otherwise, we cannot do it. Or we can create some maps in 2D, but this is not uh, very important. Okay, so the next summer school, we will present, uh, I'm not going to present, the students will present the, their work. Okay, about Sadorini. So this is the, the answer to the, the to your question. Yeah, definitely. We can do that. That's one of the other areas where it's useful to understand what it is you need as well. Yeah, yeah, because primarily the terrain we have is, is static, like you mentioned. Whereas yeah. understanding what it needs to change, I think it is an interesting problem to just be done so. Ben. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, sorry, I, I, uh, I was taken off into augmented reality here for a minute. Um, from your group, do you have anything to say about what you've learned in the augmented reality? Does it make you want to do something with it? Well, would you like to say that uh, for us, uh, about the definition of augmentation, the definition of uh, the reality of visual and the 
scale of this decision. And so many times we in our project we observe a little scale of this. So uh, yeah, yes, the, the whole clip uh, input resolution is difficult to the problem of this. And so we think that the, the improvement in the directing in this case for uh, the geology is the scale. So going scale to be a little uh, object uh, that can really help geology. So geology, yes, it must improve, uh, it can take into account uh, mountains, but it can take account also grain of sand. So it's difficult to, to, to apply all this in a computer, but uh, we can see that uh, we are strongly approached in this direction. One question I have for you. Um, if you were in the field, uh, how would you use augmented reality? How do you think you could use augmented reality to help your field work? Well, uh, rather than just acquiring it, is there a use for this for you in the field? I think uh, there is a use because, uh, well, for example, I refer to my personal working experience in Iceland where we study these structures that are kilometers and kilometers long and maybe with the, the augmented reality you can have um, a, a, the, yeah, sorry, the virtual reality you have a, a better idea of how geological structures develop in the field and so uh, you can also plan better your field trip because you go in places that you know that are the most significant is what comes to my mind. Okay. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. And for the oceanographers, because we have also students from the master program of oceanography, yes. how useful is to have a virtual reality in order to explore the sea floor? Is it useful or not? Is it possible to have the virtual reality? Yes. You need to have the data. We have created the workflow. You take the data, ah, the web data, and use the virtual reality in order to show to the other people how the seafloor looks like. Is it useful or not? Why? Because uh, we have a 2D model, and it's not so clear to explain what is the morphology of the seafloor, but with 2D, we have an opportunity to feel like a um, walk inside, uh, on the top of the seafloor, you can see around you everything. And? The most important? And? You go outside, you collect the data, okay, as a geoscientist, as a oceanographer, you take the data and you have the opportunity, the ordinary people, the people that they are not working on the vessel, they will have the chance to explore the sea floor without being on board. This is the most important. Yes. But for example, everybody can go to the island that we went yesterday, can fly a drone, or they can see the landslide, the one that we all see yesterday. But comparing to the sea floor, it's impossible. No, so I think, yeah, so it's, it's very, very important to have virtual reality, okay, and have the SWAT data or the ROV data there to explore the ocean floor mm -hmm. without participating in a survey. This yeah, is, I think that's what yeah, this is, saying about This is the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. So the virtual reality also for the offshore hazards that we are going to present, you will see that yeah. some huge institutes, <coughs> like a uh, very big institute like Barry from USA, or Woods Hole, or MIT, okay, they have already process the SWAT data in the ROV, they have already some videos of virtual reality and the museums, in, especially in Canada and in America, they have, you are, you are entering a museum and you are wearing the special glasses, so you will feel that you are on the sea floor exploring, okay, whatever you want to do, to see, okay. And also from the biological point of view, not only from the geological point of view, but also from the geology, from biology, okay. Uh, and all the museums, I think all the museums in USA, they have the chance to, to explore the sea floor wearing the special glasses. Okay. Other questions? Any general comments before we fire you a yeah. specific one? 
No con esos dos que apenas. No. They're very tired. No, no. So, is it better for you? Just a general question, just to 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 learn more as a, as professors. Is it better to interact uh, all of you with some questions and games like we did today, or just having uh, here in the classroom and just looking for a very nice presentation for different <laughs> types of professors? Okay. Yeah. The that we did today, I think it's better than today. Yeah. So I think you see the result. They use their brains. Yeah. Very so. yeah. So this is another uh, scope of the Erasmus. So you need also to tell us, okay, how do you like we have the Erasmus summer school? Okay. So because we are going to give a report to the Erasmus office. So it's a better way to do what? To do some to play some games, to have some data, to collect some data, and play the play with the data, process the data, and make some presentation. You can present the data, like Martin, like the other guy, so I don't remember all the names. Okay, rather than to have all the presentation from very high quality professors and so on. Okay. <laughs> okay, that they have experience. Okay. Thank you. I, I think we should give you a time limit of 5.30 because <laughs> So let's let's get together just for 15 minutes more and try and get the brains working. So we talked about undersea data. Uh, when you were out in the field yesterday and we were looking at the cliff, I think Malcolm, when he gave his talk, I think it was Malcolm, so long ago I can't showed a cross-section through the landslide that went under the ground and under the sea. So what would be useful for you to have to really understand this landslide, or Santorini, or somewhere else like that, uh, that could make you see the whole picture? You will see this picture if you will participate in the Severin Summer School. We will try. Ah. So what do you mean, like, like the, the why we should understand all the material like the what, object? What, what do you need? What would be useful to understand the whole object? What, what were we missing yesterday? I asked I ask Derek, did you did you find any landslides on the sea floor? Yeah, that was my question. And he said, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. 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 So he didn't really know. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't he didn't know. Yeah. Maybe they have done some rough mapping so. So can I so from the scientific point of view, would you expect that there would be a landslide? That continue the last time we saw outside the water yesterday, but also inside the water. Is that the level of water? Yeah. Yes. But we, uh, we, we don't have the whole picture with this survey. We need to go under the water to connect. We also need to go underground. Yeah. And if you saw the presentation of DGF, they have yeah. ways of looking under the ground. So for, for me, the virtual reality goes much, much further eventually. Far far more advanced than what we could possibly do in this project, to be able to go from land to underwater, to drain the seas, drain the seas, but to be able to go in under, into the, the object, and be inside. Because everything goes on underneath. The surface is just the expression of where we are. But we could free ourselves from that and be like ghosts. Um, so that's a, that's an even bigger challenge for you. Yeah, but uh, there are some companies, petroleum companies, and they use virtual reality. I know that there was a presentation also from Fugra, yeah, and at the end for January. So they use virtual reality in order to not collect the data, but to present the seismic data, okay, beneath the sea floor or beneath the on land, okay. And uh, they show to the people how are how are the geological formations of the layers, okay, to yeah. allow for them to explore and mm -hmm. explore the oil. So it's also affected by corporal data, right? Yeah. Different yeah. layers and depths, right? Yeah. 
And for the outreach to the general public, for example, in Volcania, near Clermont Ferrand, they have a visit to a magma chamber. Yeah. And they go in and they get a virtual experience of uh, what a magma chamber would be like. It's like diving in one of your yeah, yeah. UAVs, or whatever you call them. Uh, and they go in that. I think, Emmanuel, you have a, the journey to the central of the Earth. Yes, but it's, uh, for it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has, it's explosive and really better. No, but it's not even better, this but is creative technology, so yeah. we, we are allowed to be poetic as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is the CPI element on top of the actual data, or yeah. the actual data system. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what one point from what I showed you yesterday, or the day before, the day before that, talking about presenting hazards to people. If you present anybody a geological map, a hazards map, they don't understand it. And this is very clear. Uh, if you present them something, for example, draped on Google Earth, which they can see in their own reality, they understand it much better. And we, there are many cases of disasters that have occurred because they have the map, they have the information, but they don't understand it because it hasn't been communicated in a way. So there's a mismatch between communities. And that's where the virtual reality can bring us together and also to present people an event happening. So if you have a landslide or an earthquake, people can experience that and therefore prepare themselves. So, um, so that's, that's another thing to be doing. So maybe you will find some examples when you are looking for offshore geohazard. You may find some examples in YouTube, but there are some people that they present their data in virtual reality. Okay. So, Sense about that. Yeah. It kind of yeah. be for example, or definitely the Woods College or some great institutes have already produced that. Okay. Great. Malcolm, you want to add something else? Yeah. No, it's it. Um, I know from talking to colleagues in industry, virtual reality is very important to them to communicate to their more senior members of the team. So often when they're trying to actually ask for more money or trying to get them to invest in something, they actually use virtual reality as a way to uh, to communicate not just with stakeholders but with bosses. So actually not, not more widely but quite focused upwards to more senior members who don't have much time but um, they want to communicate them very quickly and very effectively and virtual reality is by far the best way of doing it. There's a lot of interest in, in this, uh, not the dissemination to the public, in a, which is part of it, but also upwards to their bosses, and often very senior people in the industry. Um, so it's, it's a very valuable tool in that way as well. So we mustn't forget that, because that is also an important part of uh, use of this tool. Perhaps the last point before we finish to go with that is that when you're presenting something to these bosses to get money, uh, you may want to present them something that will make them give you money. So there's also a danger that you present them something which is not the reality that they need, but something you've created. So this evening, while we're drinking for Evie, uh, perhaps we can think about the ethical, uh, the ethical repercussions of using virtual reality because we're taking real data and we're presenting it in another way. And there may be good ways of doing that, and there are plenty of bad ways of doing that. And that's something you always need to remember when you're doing something like this. What do you want out of it? What are the risks for you in doing it? What are the costs of what you're doing? And are the methods you're using actually going to benefit you in the long term?